Hi, guys. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. I've got my cup of tea. I'm at home. Is that allowed? Oh, of course. Get comfortable. <laughs> so our podcast is about uh, your journey in the music industry, really how you, uh, you know, got signed EMI and, and, and you know, Kaja Gugu, all that. I wanted to know if, yeah, we'll, we'll go over all that if that's cool with you. That's cool. I'm ready. <laughs> that's good. Where are you? Do you live in England still? Yes, um, I'm two two miles outside of Greater London, in a nice county called Hertfordshire. Okay, I've never um, been out there. To the UK? I have it. No, my wife and I are dying to get out there. Omg! I know. Well, don't come now. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Wait a few months. <laughs> At least. Yeah. 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 Right on. Did you grow up pretty close to where you live now? No, I, I grew up in a small town called Wigan, okay. where Ian, uh, the actor Ian McKellen went to school. Oh, wow. And yeah. I did read that you were inspired. You kind of aspired to be an actor when you first, before you got into music, right? Well, no, music was always my absolute driving passion. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And we'll get into that, but no, it was always music. <laughs> okay. Well, then tell me how you got into music. Well, I was the kid at school, the music nerd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I saved my pocket money. Do you have? Do you call it pocket money in America? Yeah, cash or pocket money. Yeah, that makes. Yeah, sense. it's the money. It's the money you you kind of you might get like from your parents once a week. Oh, like an allowance. Oh, you call it an allowance. Okay. Yeah, that's what you'd give like your yeah, Sutter daughter or whatever, a couple bucks to yeah, like, have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it wasn't very much money. It was like, you know. <laughs> anyway, it was enough to buy one vinyl single. And I used to excitedly go down to my local record, independent record shop, remember those. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, yeah, I would be so excited because um, this the record was something that I was hearing on the radio. It felt culturally important. And I would go down to my, um, we had this thing called a youth club. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd go there twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday nights, my local youth club, and I would have my new vinyl. And everybody kind of said, we let him deal with the records because he's always got the latest stuff. So I sort of, I became the self-appointed DJ. And, and then I always thought I'd be involved in music. You know, I thought I might become a presenter or DJ or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I had to know, I had to know who designed the sleeve, um, who produced it, who wrote it, um, what other records were on this company? You know, I was just so passionate about music. I, I don't really know why. Um, I think you can hear people say that this sort of stuff, depending what their chosen profession is. You know, like dancers mm -hmm. might say, I always knew I wanted to dance. <laughs> so um, when, I, when I eventually got to London at um, 18, I met a girl who introduced me to a theater agent. And at this time I was having singing lessons and piano lessons, recording demos in studios and things like that. Wow. And this, this agent sent me for an audition for a theater show, which I'd never really given much thought. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I was touring uh, in Josephine, the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Wow. Mm -hmm. I played Benjamin, the youngest brother, and I was doing eight shows a week, which when you're singing full on, because in, in Joseph, everybody sings a lot. Mm -hmm. So it was a great way to kind of learn my instrument, really. What, what works, what doesn't work, what upsets it, what it likes. 
And then from that show, I went into production of Godspell by Stephen Schwartz, who wrote the current hit Wicked. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Six, I think that was the 60s show. And then in between all of this, I was writing de- songs and in and out of demo studios. Because in those days, we didn't have computers. You had to go into a recording studio mm-hmm. with tape. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, um, yeah, imagine. <laughs> well, well, first, tell, before, that's, that's awesome. I want to know real quick, but like, what was the first instrument you learned to play? You said you were singing and playing piano. Did your parents kind of push you into piano? Like, how did you get into that? Oh, no, my parents were not musical. Okay. Um, my, dad, my dad played the guitar a tiny bit, but no, we there was no encouragement. In fact, my dad was a minor, and I was expected to do the same. And that might be part of the reason I ran away because the idea of going down those mines was not appealing to me. Yeah, and then you went to school. You by running away, you meant leaving to go to school. I I finished school and okay. like two weeks two weeks later I took my my salary my wages and I was off. Oh wow! <laughs> my dad my dad was a bit of a bully. Um, he drank a lot and then he would get um, aggressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we didn't get on that great. Um, I don't think he he understood me really. Um, I certainly didn't understand him. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I couldn't wait to leave. Really. Wow. I'm sorry. That must have been rough. It's right. Yeah. It's all right. Well, I spoke to a psychologist. Um, I don't have an analyst, but I I did see one once for a reality TV show. But that's another story. <laughs> but um, we talked about this, and she said um, it's often the people who are who have kind of a tough upbringing are the ones who want to succeed the most to kind of prove their point, you know? Yeah, so, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I, like exactly. A, I sh- I'll show you type mentality. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't know that at the time, but I think it did do that to me. Yeah. Definitely. So it's maybe a good thing in the long run. <laughs> well, yeah, you never know. Um, <laughs> So you went to school. Did you go to school for music or musical theater? Um, or, no, or it was, was all or, like... Or is it just for, like, are you talking when you left, was it just like uh, primary school or secondary school or did you go to college? No, I I, I didn't go to college. I oh, left, okay. I left home. I just took jobs, you know. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and used my money to, to pay for tuition. Wow. Okay. And then you, sorry, go ahead. No, that that crazy notion of making it somehow, spending all my money. (laughs) Um, But, you know, we we used to have, in England, in the UK, a lot of bars, as you know, are called pubs. Mm -hmm. And there was a culture of talent contests in pubs. And for the pub, it was a great way to get the customers in because uh, the, the acts that were competing would bring friends and it was free entertainment. Great idea. So, but I'd go off to all these talent contests. Some I won, some I uh, lost. But it was great experience. Yeah. So I was kind of, you know, just building everything up. Were you just playing as a solo artist or were you performing with bands and stuff? Sometimes they had like a, a trio, so it'd be drums, bass, keyboards, usually piano or synths, mm-hmm. and you'd have your dots, as we called it, your your scripted music, and you just throw it to the guy. Could you play that in G? <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> it was really before backing tracks had taken off, so everything was live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so but you'd show up with the song written out and say, "Okay, here, here's the notes. Play it," and I, and it would be something that you wrote personally. And so you'd have to know the, how to. Oh, just no, covers. All the, ta- all the talent contests were covers. Absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what what covers were you doing? Do you remember? 
Yesterday by the Beatles. Um, that's when the music takes me by Kiki D. Do you remember that one? I don't. I'd have to hear it. If I heard it, I'd Oh, hang I on. I think that might be Neil Sedaka. What did she do? She did something like that. Anyway, yeah. I love Neil Sedaka. Some of his songs were beautiful. Solitaire and um, others. Um, who else? Yeah, just, you know, anything that was vaguely, you know, mainstream, really. Sure, yeah. And you said, okay, so you said you got into this um, musical like a musical uh, play, right? You're, you're singing, performing in a play? Uh, well, it's a musical, isn't it? Joseph and Godspell. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. So you're playing in the, in the musical, but had you ever acted or how did you, you said you went to an audition where did you have experience acting and stuff or was that kind of strange for you to go, okay, I know this guy can sing and perform, but being a part of this whole, you know, Okay. I had, so to speak. Yeah, I had some weekend training at the Italia Conti Stage School. So I got some acting lessons there. I wouldn't call myself an actor by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> but, you know, that thing in life called Lady Luck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need a bit of that. And, and you know, it's, it's a bit like sometimes... The, the the main actor breaks the leg and the understudy goes on and does really well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bit of luck. Um, I did, um, I turned up for an audition for a, a small acting role in a, in a television part. And I, and I got it just mainly because, probably because nobody else showed up. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it looked good on the CV. I was much more... <laughs> I was much more excited about being an extra in Adam and the Ants video for Stand and Deliver. The song. I didn't read that. And I want to talk to you about that. So how did that happen? So um, I was working at the Embassy Club in Old Bond Street in central London. It's a very cool hangout mm -hmm. club. And uh, we had a lot of music people in there, media people. And uh, there was a famous uh, director Mike Mansfield used to, his assistant used to go in there, a guy called Hillary, Scottish guy. And uh, yeah, one night he just said to me, we're shooting Adam's, Adam and the Ants new video this weekend. We need some extras. Uh, we'll pick you up at six in the morning in central London by coach. Um, we're going off to Hatfield House. This is where Princess Elizabeth was kept in the 1500s, Elizabeth I, Hatfield House. It's wow. a stately home, yeah, stately home in, in Hertfordshire, where I live now. Uh, and, yes, and he said, you'll get paid like $50 for the day. Um, so, yeah, that, that's how it came about. Wow. That's cool. That's so cool. You remember watching it and seeing yourself for the first time in the video? I remember watching the video the first time, and I was shocked that from, from 18 hours of filming, and I was in many scenes, I basically ended up on the editing cutting room floor. Oh. If you blink, if you blink, you'll miss me. If you <laughs> actually, I, a lot of people are asking me this question recently on social media. So I, I, um, I managed to freeze frame it. This tiny, this it's <laughs> almost, it's a bit blurred, but literally, I'm on this long banqueting table with all the other wacky looking extras. I've got all this oil paint on my face. And, and just basically looking like an alien. And, and Adam is on the table performing uh, the song and, and he's right in front of me. It was, very, it was a great experience. I really loved it. I wanted to be up on the table, believe me. I was going to ask you that. Is that. Did that kind of give you an extra push? Like, okay, I really, really want to do the music thing? I was just so excited. Yeah, of course. You know, it, it suddenly it was real. It was touchable. It was right there. This mm -hmm. is what people can do if they want, you know? Yeah. And then how did you start playing in bands and stuff? Like, what was the first band you formed? You said you were doing, like, demoing and, and performing to these, bat, like, these battle, battle of the band type things at the pubs. Um, I joined a band, and we called ourselves Crossword. Okay. And... Um, <clears throat> That didn't go anywhere. 
Then I, then I was in, I auditioned for another band. Have you heard of a British band called Bugs Fizz? I haven't. Okay. Have you heard of the Eurovision Song Contest? I have heard of that. Yeah. Well, Bugs Fizz won it for the UK in 1981. Wow. Uh, and they, they had a string of hits. And the, the writer of some of the Bugs Fizz, writer and producer Andy Hill, uh -huh. who, uh, who was behind the scenes for Box Fizz, went on to write a little song for a Canadian singer called Celine Dion. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, uh, the song's called Think Twice. So there was really, good, my point is that there was really good pedigree behind this Eurovision act called Box Fizz. But mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the four members of Box Fizz is a guy called Mike Nolan, who's got a beautiful voice. And they had about um, three number ones in the UK and a, a certainly wow. 10, 10 or so uh, top 10 hits. I was in a band with one of Bucks Fizz before Bucks Fizz, before Kaji Gugu. Okay. Uh, and in, in the UK, when I tell that story, people get very excited. Oh, you were in a band with Mike Nolan. <laughs> so, so that, but that didn't work out. The, the band I was in with Mike didn't work out. But, you know, he went on to join Bucks Fizz and I went on to join Kajikugu. Yeah. So, yeah, how did, so from there you, was Kajikugu the next band that you joined? Right after well, that what, band? What happened was um, I put an advert in a sort of music paper, called, uh, UK music paper, very popular at the time, called Melody Maker. And, the classified adverts in Melody Maker were quite infamous for bands that began like Spandau Ballet and Erasure and others. And uh, so I put an ad in there looking for a band and uh, the bass player from Art Nouveau, who later became Kaji Gugu, Nick Beggs, uh, who played that fantastic bass on Too Shy. Oh, okay. He called me up and he said, Lamal, I know you looking for your own band. We're also looking for a singer, but we haven't found anyone. Do you want to come up? So I went up to this town called Leighton Buzzard, which is about 40 to 50 miles outside of London. And um, I met the guys and we rehearsed in the birthday card factory where the drummer worked, Jez. Mm -hmm. then uh, basically they offered me the job if you like and I called my theatre agent and I said okay I'm leaving London I'm joining a band don't offer me any more auditions <laughs> and I always smile when I think he probably put the phone down and thought well I'll never hear from him again <laughs> yeah <laughs> that'll be the last we hear of that one next <laughs> <laughs> so that was the beginning of Kajagugu then so then I left London. Um, okay. That was that was a big commitment, you know? Yeah. I, and I lived with Nick and his girlfriend. Um, basically, we spent 18 months, two years, writing songs, recording demos. Um, and slowly we all, they all left their jobs and we, we got what's called a government benefit, you know, mm -hmm. which is just enough money to, you know, survive eat food and stuff uh, but it paid off you see because um after two years and having all these demos ready i came back to london i was working at the embassy club again mm -hmm. and uh one night i served a drink to the keyboard player from duran duran nick rhodes oh man and um i started telling him about the band and you know what stage we were at and stuff like that and you see, I didn't know. He was already thinking about doing some production work. And oh. he said to me, he goes, Lamal, send me your cassette. Do you remember those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said, um, send me your cassette. I'll have a listen. And uh, a week later, he called me and he said, really like the songs. I'm going to take them into our record company, EMI Records. Tell them I want to produce you. And that's what happened. Oh my gosh. We, we got signed and Nick Rhodes uh, co-produced the, 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 the only album I made with Kajigugu, the White Feathers album mm -hmm. that contained Too Shy. 
And that was done with their producer, the Duran Duran producer, a guy called Colin Thurston. Wow, that's crazy. So you knew that it was, you knew it was him. You knew it was Nick Rose when you when you served him the drink. Are you kidding? I, I, I've just bought their first album, and they were like big in the charts. Um, yeah. What was the the first hit? Was Planet Earth and Girls on Film was on that first album, and it was so great. Uh, and I was really excited. Oh, yeah. My goodness, Nick, <laughs> but you know, it was the kind of club where you had to be cool. You know, you couldn't go all. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 And you know, we used to see a lot of famous people in there. I mean, I saw Boy George in there, Steve Stray from Visage. I saw wow. Lemmy from Motorhead, the rock band. Yeah. He was fun to watch because he was always piling his money into the, the fruit machine, the slot, and, and losing. And then he'd get drunk and start attacking the fruit, the slot machine. <laughs> and a couple of times, um, they had to call security to calm him down. You know, it was really funny. Wow. Um, I saw <laughs> Gary Newman in there. Do you know who Gary Newman is? Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. That's it was cool. A cool. It was such a cool club. I think it's in it's on Wikipedia. The the manager was a real kind of entrepreneur, Stephen Hater, uh, with his kind of dubious, uh, dubiously titled Lady Edith Foxwell was was kind of behind it all. A sort of elderly lady who always somehow managed to have a, a um a handsome guy on her arm who was about 35 <laughs> years younger. Oh no, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well that's so I mean that's crazy that he actually you know took the took the tape home and actually listened to it and called you back because I'm sure nine out of ten times when an artist gets a demo from somebody it's like oh yeah I'll listen to this you know and just exactly. so the fact that he listened to it wow it's almost like when you have when you meet somebody on the street or or, or just out in a bar or something, and they say, or, or or colleagues in a, you know, maybe in an office box, and you go, "Let's do lunch," and but it doesn't really mean let's do lunch, you know. Sure. It's just polite. It's just <laughs> polite small talk. So, yeah. no, I did not expect him to call, and when he did, and I, I put the phone down, and I always describe myself as picking myself up off the floor. I'm going, I called the band immediately. I said, guys, you're not going to believe it. Nick Rose just called me back. You know, it was one, it was a, a seminal moment. Absolutely. Sure. Wow. And what was on the tape? Was that, did it have too shy on the tape? It did not. Oh my gosh. Wow. I know it had white (laughs) feathers. It had white feathers. This car is fast. Uh, Ooh. What else is on there? I think ergonomics or something else. No, Too Shy came later. Can you believe that? Wow. Tell me about writing Too Shy and, and putting that song out. Did you know or have any like inclination that it was going to become this massive hit? Well, you, you can ask many stars, many musicians the same question. They always say the same 99% of the time. No idea whatsoever. <laughs> um, are you familiar with the song um, uh, by Rose Royce called Car Wash? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I did a, a theatre tour in the UK in 2004 with Gwen Dickey, the, the singer from, uh-huh. uh, from Rose Royce. And she lives in the UK. And I asked her about Car Wash and she, she told me, she was <laughs> saying to the... She was saying to the producer, Norman Whitefield, Whitfield, who the hell wants to hear a song about washing cars? What a <laughs> load of rubbish. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so true. It's sometimes you'll hear these songs and it's like, well, even like the Beatles, like Octopus's Garden, or like how they have those, some of those kiddie, like more of the juvenile songs. And then there are today, these, boom, they're still huge today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when I, when... When we recorded Too Shy, I mean, I liked it. You know, Mm. I thought it was really interesting. I I loved the intro and um, it felt it felt like a really fun track. But the the thing I'll never forget, and I've said this in interviews, is the single came out on January the 3rd, our first single. And 
I was in the EMI Records building over the Christmas just before, and one of the executives pulled me aside in the corridor and he said, look, Lamar, your first single too shy, it won't be a hit, but it will get you noticed. And so I spent Christmas slightly disappointed because I thought what he told me was gospel, you know? Sure. And then wow. not, not only was he wrong about it being a hit, it was number yeah. one. And then wasn't just number one in the UK, it was number one all over the world. And so my opinion of marketing <laughs> corporate types after that went down somewhat. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, talk, talk to tell me about uh, signing with EMI. You said, um, you know, you got the, the introduction there. Uh, but like, what was it like signing the contract? Or did you have to go in and like, I've heard, I've heard stories about artists having to go in and like, you know, kind of not showcase, but like showcase in like a conference room or something like play their music for, for the label. Did you have to do any of that? There was um, a lot of toing and froing with the lawyers. Mm -hmm. about the contract eventually on signing day after everything had been agreed uh, we went in and uh, official photos were taken i've got i've got copies in my loft oh cool um, yeah they're lovely pictures that's and awesome it, you know we're all like young guys 22 23 <laughs> years old all excited we're signing a record contract with one of the biggest companies in the world the company that signed the beatles etc so, um, and then uh, the process of, of the A&R department of the record company. So for, for the layman out there, is, that means artists and repertoire. That's the department in record companies and music publishing companies that look for acts to sign, for artists to sign. Uh, but... Um, Instead of calling them A and R, as in artists and repertoire, we call them mm, ah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can <laughs> never make a decision, so it's mm, ah. So we call them. We call them omanamen, omanamen, omanamen. So, I love that. Yeah, it's true. So the so anyway, so the A and R department had to kind of um, encourage this massive company about a new signing. So lots of little uh, flyers were sent out. We did gigs. We performed at the EMI conference. There was a lot of shaking of hands and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then um, we had a couple of lucky breaks. Um, a DJ, uh, a big DJ, a radio presenter in the UK mm -hmm. was making a new TV show. Um, uh, on, an, on the new TV channel, Channel 4 in the UK. And, uh, and he, was a, he was a famous uh, radio presenter. And uh, he pulled in a big audience. And the first half of the show was dedicated to an artist who was currently very successful. And that at the time was Phil Collins. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and then he wanted to contrast that with a, a brand new artist who just signed their record deal and the, the, all the behind the scenes stuff, you know, discussing the video, the storyboard, the director sat there, some behind the scenes at the studio, all that sort of stuff. And it was a massive audience. And of course, it, they, showed the, they showed our video at the end of the TV show. So that together wow. with everything else, yeah, just really helped to push the song. And then the next thing we know, um, the biggest music show in the UK at the time would be the equivalent, I guess, of say Soul Train or American Bandstand. Okay. It, you've heard of it. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Pops. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we have a population of like 50 million, but at the time, if you did top of the pops, sometimes they had they had a a rough audience figure of 25 million, so half the country. Oh my gosh, that's so Huge. crazy. That if is you did crazy. If you did Top of the Pops, you were more or less guaranteed to fly up the chart, and that's what happened. We got Top of the Pops. We were so, in fact, I think Top of the Pops appearance meant more to us than actually getting to number one because it represented so much, you know. Wow. 
That must have been such a cool moment, though, watching your song just go, you know, up the chart. Wow. Well, you know, everybody knows that um, the Kajigugu split was a little bit acrimonious and certainly premature. But mm -hmm. um, and they ask me, you know, am I bitter about it and stuff like that? And I say, no way, because I had so much fun in that short space of time. That's what I focus on. There were so many firsts, you know, mm -hmm. the first single, the first number one, the first Royal Variety performance, the first, you know, American top five hit and mm -hmm. so on. That yeah. was superb. Did you do like a, once you guys signed the deal and you have the single the number one, did they put you on like some big tours and stuff? Well, um, before before the single was released, we actually were we played on a tour with a band called Fashion at the time, mm -hmm. um, a Birmingham band, and um, we we were the support. Um, so that's what you had to do back then. It was mm -hmm. part of the uh, apprenticeship, really. You know, you you had to be seen to have toured as support. It was all part of. Um, the normal it was the norm that's what you had to do mm -hmm. so yeah we toured as support with fashion i think it was like 12 dates across the uk and then uh, the single came out so that was autumn and the single okay. came out in the january and then did you did you guys do another tour on the success of the single or yeah was, yeah okay sold uh crazy beatlemania Really? So it was like oh, a total God. change from that first total one. Total change. Oh, it was mad. In fact, <laughs> the, the, you know, you know, my hair was so famous. I mean, as soon as I came <laughs> yeah. on top of the pops. So like the next day I go to my local um, grocery store just to get something like milk or something, you know, um, or cheese. And people were pointing and going, hey, saw you on top of the pops last night. And I was thinking, oh. God, I think I'm famous. <laughs> it's that's it's wild to think about how now it would be a million people asking you to take your picture. <laughs> At least Wouldn't back it? then you you could just say, Oh yeah, hi, <laughs> and kind of yeah. be on your way. But now everybody would be but, surrounding you trying to take photos and <laughs> Yeah. The, the, the selfie is the new autograph. Oh yeah. Oh, was that still? Yeah, I didn't think about that. A lot of people probably just had you sign whatever was in their pocket or yeah, whatever they had. What was the Absolutely. most ridiculous thing you can you remember signing something and being like? Well, I signed um, breasts. Oh well, yeah, you know. I figured as much. <laughs> yeah, I've I've signed I've signed butt cheeks. <laughs> I've signed uh, I've signed. Um, I've signed items of clothing. I've signed a pair of knickers. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What the, Those days aren't, a, the, it's, people aren't really doing that much anymore. That Now that you mentioned it, I haven't think, I've never thought about that, but the whole like, whatever you have on you or sign my arm or sign my, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, last year I had someone ask me to sign their mobile phone. Wow, that's pretty. Yeah, that's pretty rad. <laughs> and this was like a brand new looking iPhone or something. And I, I said to the guy, "Are you sure you want me to sign this phone? You know, with a with a permanent marker? You know." I said, "What do you do if you want to sell this phone? <laughs> It'd be worth more. <laughs> Maybe. <worth> more. <laughs> Maybe." You know, obviously, there's a huge success with Too Shy, and then. You started your own solo thing, like this after the split of Cod Judge Goo Goo, and then tell me about getting, you know, pitch for the Never Ending Story. Okay, so my first solo single in the UK was a song called "Only for Love." Okay, uh, and it was a big hit in Europe um, and the UK, and EMI. Records asked me to go to Japan to this massive event called the Tokyo Music Festival, and there were um, this this thing had an amazing history. You know, people like Diana Ross had been there, and 
Lionel Richie and Stevie wow. Wonder. Uh, the year that I was there, um, Laura Brannigan was also there. She was having a big hit across the world with the song called Gloria. Okay. You know that one? Yeah, I do. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so while I'm there, um, I met the producer, Giorgio Morona, who was also there, you know. And then uh, I came back to the UK, and a few weeks later, he called my manager and said, um, he'd like to try, try my voice on a new movie soundtrack that he was working on. Now, here's a guy with three Academy Awards for movie soundtracks. Um, Flashdance, What a Feeling, Aaron Cara. You Take My Breath Away by Berlin from Top Gun. Wow. Uh, so it's kind of like if you're an actor and you get a call from Steven Spielberg, you know? Right. <laughs> I, I got very excited. Um, I, I knew his work. I knew all those brilliant Donna Summer records. So yeah, I I I, uh, I took a flight to Munich where he had his he, he did most of his early recordings because he lived near the German border. He's Italian. Mm -hmm. um, it's an unmistakably Italian name, isn't it? Giorgio Morotta, <laughs> <laughs> and he speaks like that a little bit. Well, he did when I met him. Um, so yeah, so I arrive in. Um, in, in Munich, and I'm only 23 years old, so what did I do the night before? I went out partying. <laughs> of course, of course. So I, I turn up in Munich, I've had like four hours sleep, I've been drinking, smoking, and when we tried the song in the afternoon, my voice was just going, no way, no way. <laughs> it was not having it, so, I apologized. I felt slightly embarrassed. And I just said, look, Georgia, my voice doesn't work till after six o'clock, <laughs> which is kind of true. <laughs> um, and he was, he was very cool. I mean, he, I wonder if he was a bit worried, but he didn't show it. He just said to me, hey, Lynn, don't worry. We, we have some wine. We have, um, we have uh, some food. Uh, we try again later. Now, there are rumors uh, I've heard on the internet that I, he got me drunk to perform the song. <laughs> yeah. You haven't confirmed it? <laughs> no, no, no. I had, I had two glasses of wine. I certainly wasn't drunk. But, oh, okay. it, you know, just having some food and a bit more time and chilled out. I might have been a bit nervous. I don't know. Sure. Uh, but anyway, we nailed it about eight o'clock in the evening. Uh, and then I flew back to London, and two days later, I was told that he liked it, and he was going to use it. Wow. And then you did a another version in, in French, too, right? Like oh, the French been, version of the song? You've been doing your research. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that. Do you speak French, or was that a whole uh, a lot of... Adam, Adam, let me tell you... <laughs> Je ne parle pas français. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I don't speak French. Um, I didn't, I certainly didn't speak anything at the time. Um, but they said to me, um, there, was a, there was a union rule in France at the mm -hmm. time uh, that radio stations had to play a certain amount of French language um, uh, music. Artists. And so they hired a French singer female to do to to record the duet this would this would create more airplay mm -hmm. the song um i didn't really understand it all i just thought oh that sounds fun doing a french version i mean i'm just 23 i'm not really you know so um yeah they had a translator there and i did it line by line and it's turned up now it's turned up now on the internet yeah <laughs> and i listened to it the other day and even my partner said to me, you don't speak French, do you? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not a word. So um, it worked, though. Apparently, they were very pleased with it, and it got a good response. And, I mean, French is a beautiful language anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I really I really wish I did speak it. I tried. It's a, it's a tough language to learn. 
Yeah, I I can't speak another language. I've tried. I've tried Spanish about ten times. I just can't <laughs> seem to remember the words and stuff. Yeah, not for me. It, yeah, yeah. I think if you're an English speaker, we're a bit lazy because it's so international. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like, well, somebody will understand me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, look, uh, it's the it's the international language of pilots. Oh, you know, is they it? All speak. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They always speak in English. Um, international pilots, and uh, I don't know. Um, movies. The biggest movies are English going around the world. You know, either yeah. American or yeah. So that's yeah. That's that's interesting. I didn't know that about uh, airplane pilots. Mm. She's there. The translator's telling you the the line to sing, but then you have to sing it. The word is different, so the inflection would be different on how you're trying to sing the song, right? To keep it in, yeah, like but I, similar. Like, like, was that kind of mind warping? Like, I don't. I think that would be hard to do. You know, when you're 23, you don't have any nerves. You're just like, yeah, what do you want me to do? Okay, I'll give that a go. I just, <laughs> just went for it. <laughs> I just, I just went for it. You know, if if they were happy with the phrase, I trusted them, so they sure. kind of said suggested how it you know should be oh then, okay yeah so they kind of suggested how it should be translated and how maybe it could be sung that way i wonder if they changed oh. the words up a little bit yeah there was a, a french translation it would have been no 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 language translation is ever like verbatim. sure totally yeah exactly so from from that i mean that song is still huge they're still using it like they used it in stranger things like yeah that's from from there what was the next thing that that you did musically like was that another like bump up for you as far as like if you if you played out or in your name recognition and everything else you mean you mean after stranger things no after just having the the song in never ending story well, never any story changed everything. Um, you know, it went to number one in seventeen countries, Jeez. and and to this day, um, that song and Too Shy are the reason my phone keeps ringing or my email inquiries keep coming in for live performances. Because what you have now is this incredible value in the songs because of the passing of time. Um, people tell me that it's the first record they bought. It's the first, it reminds them of the first kiss. It reminds them of a person. You know how a song can take you back to a certain time and a certain place. And so there's an amazing extra value nostalgically in those songs and the emotions that people feel when they, so when I'm performing them live nearly 40 years later, that's what keeps it fresh for me because mm-hmm. I see their excitement. I know that they're having those nostalgic memories because I, I understand that I've got songs that do that to me as a kid growing up, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so, so never any story, of course, I didn't know it at the time has become like an anthem for me, you know? And, uh, and I think um, last year when Stranger Things used it in the, finale of season three, um, I saw the monthly streams, the online streams go up from 300,000 to 1.5 million. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) And same with Too Shy, because they used Too Shy in American Horror Story. Oh, I did did see that. You you actually are in the show, right? Yeah. Tell um, me about uh, that. Yeah, well, what happened was my my 21 year old nephew sends me a WhatsApp. He's going crazy. He's filming this scene on his mobile, uh, but I can hear him, and he's going, "Oh my God, they're going to kill you, <laughs> Uncle! They're going to kill you!" <laughs> and then when I do get killed, well, he's screaming with laughter. <laughs> it was so funny. I put it straight on social media with his permission. Um, because it was his reaction that was a lot more fun than the actual. I mean, the, the scene was interesting enough, but yeah, <laughs> I got I got bumped off by Richard Ramirez, um, one of the supernaturals, and and the whole band gets slayed. We're apparently playing at a music festival 
This is Kajigugu, the band. Yeah. So we're very much part of the storyline. And um, and then, uh, yeah, as I get killed, two shows playing in the background. And <laughs> and uh, I, I thought the guy, the guy, the actor was good, but he was trying to do a British accent, but he sounded a bit Liverpool, you know, oh. like the Beatles. <laughs> yeah. I can do, if you want a Liverpool accent, I can do it for you. It's like that, you see. Uh, it's got a whole tone to it, like uh, if you're from Liverpool. And uh, I think he <laughs> said, he says to Richard Ramirez, he goes, uh, he goes, uh, what, do you want an autograph or something? Uh, and he goes, and then Richard Ramirez holds his hand up and he's got that weird um, star thing on his hand, like a bird. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Goes, and he goes, we already have your autograph. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> He's gone. Yeah, I think it's quite an accolade, isn't it, to get bumped off in um, American Horror Story? Yeah, I mean, that's huge. That's really huge. That and, I mean, yeah, that the Deverend story, like, that was something I grew up with. I remember I, every time I hear the song, I just think of the big dog and then a tray you, and it's like, it all comes back to me. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's pretty incredible. You, yeah, the, you have two songs that just define, you know, periods in time for people. That's must. That's pretty, pretty amazing. One, one was eighty three and one was eighty four. Uh, although it may have been eighty five in America for for uh, Never Ending because it came out in November here. Yes, it was probably eighty five. Okay. But um, yeah, the, those two songs have been very good to me, and people people ask me. Do you tire of these songs? And I said, no way. I've got too much respect for them. They've been too good to me. That's good. Yeah, I was going to ask you that too. If you ever get to the point where you're like, okay, I've played this song enough. But if you're still getting the reaction, I'm sure you still love doing it. <laughs> I get the smiles, you know? Yeah. I get the smiles. I get the energy. Um, I, I always enjoy perform, especially performing Too Shy because... Um, I co-wrote that one, and I think it's a fun song to sing. You know, it just makes people feel good. And the the times I meet people and they go, "Oh man, that bass line, that bass line!" I love that bass line by Nick. Oh yeah, it's such a cool song. It's such a fun, like, dancey song. You, oh, it's great. You know, YouTube is filled with bass players telling you how to play the bass line in Too Shy, and most of them have got <laughs> it wrong. <laughs> oh yeah you checked them out that's funny <laughs> i've seen a few i've seen a few nick should go on there and do it i suppose he's trying to remain mysterious i think he was yeah there were there were other there were some weird finger patterns involved uh, he was <laughs> mr he was mr jazz you know uh he was out there he, yeah Anything different, he loved it. So he was trying to be different. <laughs> it worked. Yeah, I was gonna. I was just gonna say that. Well, it, it worked for him. <laughs> so right now, you got new. Do you have new music coming out? Are you working on new stuff? Yeah. So well, because of Stranger Things and American Horror Story and Black Mirror, we didn't mention that one. Oh yeah, you, you had the song in Black Mirror as well. Yeah. How did so, that sync that, happen? Was that another? connection like how did you get that connection with the people from black mirror it was They've... another to total surprise <laughs> so when, you, when you have a big copyright out there it's kind of got a life of its own and the the people that manage it sony atv and warner music mm -hmm. um they have departments that just do this week in week out um doing sync uh um deals with um, all the people all over the world who want to use your music. So, you know, Two Shy has been used in um, The Wedding Singer with Adam Sandler film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The I think that was the 90s. Uh, yeah, that was the 90s. Yeah. About five years ago, Two Shy was used for one of the big uh, cell phone networks in France. Hmm. Uh, Never Ending Story has been used for the Swedish National Lottery. You know, uh, Too Shy was used in a potato chips commercial. <laughs> so, That's so, so funny. The, I know. So the department uh, 
uh, the, uh, the, the, the people who look after the copyright, that's what they do week in, week out. And we don't always know about it. So with Black Mirror, the net, you know, usually I, I just, I find out via social media or, you know, or I find out with a text or a WhatsApp or whatever. Mm. Um, but um, that was really cool one to get because that was the first, what they called interactive episode. I don't know if you remember that. Oh and yeah, it was where you can kind of choose your own destiny. Choose. Yes. You could, you could choose, apparently there were 500 options. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah, I've seen a couple other shows that have, that Netflix has been doing that on. It's pretty, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So the whole thing got so much publicity. So, you know, I do wonder, does one thing lead to the other? You know, mm-hmm. did, did Black Mirror lead to, um, to, to um, American things. Horror Story? Oh, American Horror Story, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's because of those shows that I just thought, well, and then and then the streaming numbers going up. I thought, well, maybe um, they might be interested in hearing something new. And mm-hmm. it's nice to have an incentive. So that gave me an incentive to sort of dip my toes in the creative water, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And then you have a. And, are you going to put a record out? Or just a yeah, single? yeah. I, I have I have a new single. Uh, I- that's that's out right now just come out three days ago and uh it's called still in love Mm -hmm. and uh you can if you visit my website lamal.com you can link all the links to social media there and see the video on youtube and stuff like that cool um it's a lovely song check it out and you're gonna put a rec sorry go ahead i should I shouldn't call a song lovely, but I do think it's lovely. I love it. <laughs> How does it compare to the rest of the songs on the record? Do you have those finished yet, or this was just the first thing you wanted to put out? Well, um, that that Still in Love is a collaboration with a German musician that I know. And collaborating is fun, because working on your own as a songwriter can be quite solitary. It's more mm-hmm. fun working with other people. You, um, you, you both bring something to the table, and and of course, you, you've got you've got someone to talk to in the tea break. <laughs> <laughs> so so I like collaborating. So that that first track is with Miro Marcus, Miro mm-hmm. Marcus from Germany. He's a great producer and musician, and I'm sure I'll be doing more with him. Um, uh, I am. I have new music ready. There's going to be a second single and either an EP or an album. I haven't decided yet. I'll, I'll see how this goes. Um, I'll watch this space is all I can say. Well, I, I've checked out the new single, Still in Love. That's awesome. I can't. What are you thinking for the next one? We're just going to let this one breathe a little bit since it just came out. Exactly, exactly. It, it's not 100% my decision. I mean, I've got a team, you know, mm-hmm. I've, I've got my PR team and my radio team here in the UK and um, sort of consulting with them. I've got mm-hmm. my own ideas, but the artist is not always right. We're a bit like the painter of a portrait or something, and sometimes you can't see it, you're too close to it. And it's it's good to you know, put things out there and see what other people think. So Mm -hmm. at the moment, there's no decision. Nice. What about, have you done? It it might be a cover version. Oh. Of a 1971 classic. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) Got to do some research now to try to figure it out. (laughs) Number number one in America. Ah, I'm going to figure it out when we get off the call. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm, uh, I'm dangling carrots for you here. Yes, you are. You are. Um, <laughs> I love it. Have you done anything? Like, what do, what do you guys do? What have you been doing in this quarantine? Have you been able to write or record or go live on any social media platform? Yeah. No, I haven't gone live, but I, I have been creative. Yeah, it's a great time for that. Um, obviously, focusing on... Uh, keeping healthy that's the main thing Mm -hmm. um 
in the UK, just before the lockdown, I went, I drove 300 miles to collect my lovely 82 year old mother, Cynthia. Oh my and I brought her down here to stay with me and my partner. That's so good. I didn't want it to, I didn't want her to be alone all that time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we didn't kill each other. <laughs> That's good. I, I, was like, <laughs> I was like in, in the, in at the deep end suddenly with mum after all these years, all that time. <laughs> you know, you know what it's like. You go home at Christmas, and f- after four days, you're like, "I'm out of here." <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, no, it was great, and uh, I I let I moved out of central London five years ago because I've lived in an apartment all my life, and I, I finally wanted a garden. So um, I, I came out here, and it, you know, it's just been lovely. There are loads of countryside and I've been cycling and trying to keep sane you know basically sure try trying to stay away from the dark chocolate in the fridge I think <laughs> <laughs> I know that's what I feel like I've just been sitting here eating <laughs> like, comfort eating yeah I know it's been bad but <laughs> apparently there's an endorphin release from chocolate so that's my excuse and I'm uh, sticking to it <laughs> <laughs> there you go there you go well, Limo, thank you so much for, for taking time out of your day to chat with me. I've had such a great time uh, talking to you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Adam. It's been great. Um, I have... There are, there are not many people I would, I would stay up this late for because here it's... Um, yeah, it's midnight here, so... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, well, that's all right. So uh, I was... I was told you were a cool guy, so. Oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> you, do the, you do the same. You do the same <laughs> for me, right? I totally would. I would. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I have one more question before I, uh, you get off the bed, if that's cool. Um, I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Oh boy. Ah. Well, believe in yourself and don't be. Uh, deterred um, because there are so many examples of um, doors being slammed in your face you know even as recent as uh, the Harry Potter author JK Rowling was turned down by all the literary agents you know oh wow Um, I didn't know that yeah yeah (laughs) eight Eight companies turned down the Beatles. Um, you know, um, uh, I remember reading a story about Huey Lewis and the News were just turned down by every label. And so, don't be deterred. Be determined, and uh, work hard. You know, I think if an, and then if an opportunity comes along, you'll be ready. And of, of course. Uh, Use social media, start early, build up a, you know, do some interesting things and be interesting, uh, you know, and and work on the music and then, and enjoy the, enjoy the journey as much as the getting there, because it may take you a while. So don't be miserable for that journey thinking, oh, I haven't made it yet. You know, (laughs) life's too short. Keep smiling. Every day is a blessing. Oh, 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 oh,